Hey guys, welcome to STEM Stream. We're gonna go through in this video the entire taxonomic ranking for human beings. We're gonna break down what taxonomy is, why it's so important in how we study evolution, how we study ancestry, how we study how all the organisms on this planet are connected and come from common ancestors. Taxonomy can be complicated at first because there's so much information, but we're gonna make this very simple for you guys and show you just how easy taxonomy can be and how important it is to the study of our evolution. Without further ado, let's get to it. Hope you enjoy the video. A taxonomy is essentially the way that biologists classify organisms. There are so many different organisms on this planet. The way we classify them and group them is through taxonomy. And this is done by taking organisms that are similar and putting them into the same species and then arranging these species into larger groups with very distinct names that create a classification system that scientists then use to study evolution and natural selection, which is essentially how all of these different species evolved over time and how they are related and interconnected with one another. The root word of taxonomy is taxon and taxon is any group within this classification system. So any group that the these organisms are placed into is called a taxon. Organisms are grouped into these taxons based on very similar characteristics. You have to share very similar characteristics with another organism in order to be grouped into the same taxon. Once these groups are established, then they can be ranked. And that's where the word taxonomic rank comes from. The whole idea of taxonomic ranking that you see here on the slide, which is basically built into this pyramid, was actually started in the 1700s by a Swedish botanist named Carl Linnau. And he was the one who revolutionized modern taxonomy and implemented this naming system that we use for all the different species of biological organisms. The way that he essentially did it is actually the way that scientists do it today. There's not much difference. The only thing that's really changed and which is the new taxon group is domain, which is at the very top of the pyramid in red. The way I want you guys to look at this pyramid is that when you start at the top, you're starting at a very general level you're gonna be having billions and billions of different species at the top. And as you move down the pyramid, things get more specific. And you can see that because each line of the pyramid, each block gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you get more and more specific as you move down to the very bottom in individual species. Let's start with the top of the pyramid, which is the domain. This is the highest taxonomic ranking. It's also called a super kingdom or an empire. Now, this is actually part of a three domain system, which is a fairly new concept. And it was introduced by a scientist named Carl Ruiz in 1977. And he was using actually something called phylogenetics to break organisms down into these domains and he used what's called ribosomal subunits but essentially he was able to break organisms down either by being single-celled bacteria or archaea or multi-celled being eukarya so these three domains in the tree of life are at the very very top so an organism is either single-celled a bacteria or an archaea which is called a prokaryote or it's multi-celled which is a eukaryote I want to remind you guys quickly the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have no nucleus. Archaea and bacteria do not have a nucleus. Eukaryotes do have a nucleus and they have membrane-bound organelles. So any organism that has a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles is going to be classified in this domain system as a eukaryote. The second ranking in the taxonomic classification system is kingdoms. And kingdoms are going to be usually broken down into five or six different kingdoms. Five kingdoms if you're in some parts of the world, six kingdoms if you're in the United States for most textbooks. Now these kingdoms are broken down either by eukaryotic organisms or prokaryotic organisms as you see on the illustration here. At the top with the eukaryotic organisms, you're going to have the kingdoms of the plants, the protista, the fungi, and the animals. At the bottom, the prokaryotes are going to be the bacteria and the archaic kingdoms. If you're using a five kingdom classification system, instead of having bacteria and archaea at the bottom, you're just gonna have monera, which is a word to describe prokaryotic organisms. The kingdoms are then broken down into the third taxonomic ranking called phylum, or phyla for plural. And here is the image from the slide before, and you can see that each of these kingdoms are gonna be broken down into phylum. Typically in most textbooks, the animal kingdom is going to be broken down to about 35 phyla. The plants are going to be broken down into about 14, the fungus into about 8. Now, phylum is based on two very important factors. It's based on something called phonetics, which is essentially the morphology, which is like the structure of the organism, and also its development. And it's also based on phylogenetics, which is using genetics 
to study how organisms are connected through evolution. So, so far with human beings, Homo sapiens, we are within the domain of Eukarya. We are within the kingdom of Animalia, or animals, and the phyla of Chordata. Now, Chordata, or chordates, refers to a group of organisms that all possess a notochord. And within humans, the notochord becomes our vertebral column. It becomes our spinal cord in development. Moving on to the fourth taxonomic rank is class. And we don't have to get too much into this, but essentially some scientists do disagree about where to classify organisms, but most of the main organisms have a consensus of where they fit in. There could be sub and infra class categories, and humans are within the class of mammalia, mammals. And there's actually about 5,450 different species of mammals. One of the very interesting characteristics that connect all species of mammals together are the presence of mammary glands, which of course in females produce milk that nurture the young. And in human beings, that milk is known as breast milk and it's very, very important for the vitality and growth of a newborn baby. The fifth taxonomic ranking is order. And now we're gonna get into some words that may be more familiar to you as we get more and more specific to human beings. So humans are the order of primates and they arose around 55 to 85 million years ago and essentially represent a lot of important adaptations to very challenging environments that they were living in, such as tropical forests where they needed increased visual acuity and they had to develop larger brains. And those are the direct result of these environmental challenges that led to natural selection and evolution. Interestingly, most mammals rely strongly on their sense of smell, while primates, on the other hand, rely more on their vision. And lastly, primates are one of the most social animals that we know today. They are extremely social in the way that they connect with one another, with the way that they rely on each other. They form groups, they protect one another, and they form very important interconnected relationships that help define the way they live and help define the way that they evolve. Now we're going to move on to family, and this is the sixth taxonomic ranking, so now we're getting pretty close to the bottom. Humans are part of the hominidae family, which members of this uh, family are known as the great apes, and this includes the human descendants, this is, includes the gorillas, the chimpanzees, so now we're including all of the apes that we know that live amongst us. It includes eight species, like I said, one of which are humans, down when we get to the bottom. They arose about 15 to 20 million years ago, and a lot of research on these animals is done by looking at fossil remains. Many of these animals are still living, so we can do genetic testing, so the genetics are very similar. And it's because we have such a close similarity, and not only in genetics, but also in physical characteristics. We have very similar in terms of the size, in terms of the way we live, in terms of what we eat. We are both omnivorous. This essentially means that we get our nutrients from plants and animals. And not only are we both omnivorous, but our gestation is around the same. Great apes, they last around eight to nine months in gestation, which is very similar to human beings. And they have a very similar cycle of gestation, which is very irregular. It can happen at any time, just like in humans can have a kid at any time. And these animals, just like humans, they live in groups and they represent this family dynamics that are very similar to human beings. Now, the last thing I want to mention is that due to this very close, similar genetic relationship between humans and great apes, many animal right organizations are trying to protect these animals such as the Grape Ape Project and this is trying to curb humans away from doing experiments on these animals that we've seen in the past that can be you know very controversial that can be seen to you know harm the animals put them into you know bad situations so there are groups that are trying to ban the testing of apes all around the world to protect these animals because they feel that they are so closely related to human beings, we shouldn't be doing these harmful testings on them for our benefit. Now let's move on to the second to last taxonomic ranking, which is the seventh rank, and this is genus. Humans are part of the genus of Homo, which in Latin means human being or man. This comprises several extinct ancestral species of human beings, such as Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis, which are the Neanderthals. They arose about two million years ago with Homo habilis, so this was the first Homo species to come about. Now these species migrated in many different areas of Africa and also of Eurasia. Anthropologists and archaeologists have been able to dig up a lot of data and approximate when these different species of human descendants lived, and where also where they lived and where they migrated. Now, approximately 200 to 300,000 years ago, the species of Homo sapiens, which anatomically are modern humans, 
they emerged most likely throughout Africa and then of course dispersed around the world to become the species that we know today. Now we finally have arrived to the last taxonomic ranking which is the eighth one and this is species. This is the most specific at the very bottom of the pyramid. Humans are homo sapiens. This is the species that we belong to. Homo sapiens is actually Latin for wise man. Like we said in the previous slide, Homo sapiens arose about 200 to 300,000 years ago, most likely in Africa. Now what scientists have done is that they have grouped all of the earlier Homo species, our ancestors, into a group called Archaic Humans. And we share anatomical similarities but also differences between these earlier humans, such as skull shape as you see from the image here. So anatomy is actually one of the key components of research that anthropologists and scientists use to differ Homo sapiens between earlier human being species. Now, if you're wondering why human beings look different than one another if we're all part of the same species, now this is something that scientists are studying and it has to do a lot with migration, the different environmental changes that have taken place according to where human beings were living around the world. It also has to do with interbreeding and other factors that basically while we are all under the same species, we're all homo sapiens, we have different physio physiology and different phenotypes, meaning we look differently, we have different heights, but we are still members of the same species and we are still evolving according to where we are living in different parts of the world, who we breed with, and this all goes and plays a part in evolution. All right, guys, I want to congratulate you for getting through this video. It's a lot of information, but I hope you understand how taxonomic ranking works, why taxonomy is important, and I just wanted to put up for you one more time the taxonomic ranking for human beings, starting with domain and ending at the bottom with species. Remember that the tree of life that we think of for organisms is essentially based on taxonomy, and taxonomy can be broken down into phonetics and phylogenetics. We use morphology and development as well as genetics to study the evolution of organisms on this planet. And from all of this information, we can build these giant trees of life that connect organisms together where we can learn about ancestry and learn about not only evolution from the past but how we might evolve in the future and that is the beauty of taxonomy it allows us to look ahead into the future of science and evolution on this planet thank you guys for watching this video and we'll see you next time on stem stream